I'm Eric Topol, and I'm really pleased to have you uh, joining us for what I think is going to be the culmination of a great couple of days uh, with this Spectrum uh, Symposium. It's a session that I've been really excited about uh, for the months since we planned it, and it's really putting together the uh, COVID pandemic story in just a couple of hours with uh, some extraordinary people. Uh, two of them I've gotten to know through the pandemic as Pro Professor Akiko Iwasaki at Yale, who is an HHMI professor there in immunobiology in, in the medical school in the School of Public Health, and uh, uh, Professor Angela Rasmussen. Uh, Angie is uh, associated with Georgetown on the faculty, but soon to be moving to Saskatchewan to the university there, the veto, uh, one of the top research uh, centers in the world. And uh, my friend, Peter Lee, who is the uh, uh, head of research at Microsoft. And uh, we're gonna be serially going through those three topics of uh, immunology, virology, and then AI and big data. We'll then have a panel and Christian Anderson, my colleague uh, at Scripps Research will join us and we'll take some of your questions I've got so many questions for these folks, it's going to be hard to get a lot of yours in, but it's going to be a fun session. Uh, and this genes, uh, vaccines, machines is kind of bringing it all together, uh, how much we've learned already uh, a year into the pandemic and how much more uh, we still have to learn uh, to get through it. So let me uh, turn over to uh, uh, Akiko. Welcome, and we'll look forward to uh, getting your comments about the uh, immunologic aspects of uh, COVID-19. Thank you so much, Eric, uh, for having me on this panel. Really delighted to be here with Angie and Peter. Um, so I'm going to start my talk. Let's see. Okay, you can see this? Okay, great. So today I'm going to focus on the immune response to SARS-CoV-2. Um, one thing that we're learning about the COVID-19 disease is that it has a very large distinct outcome of um, infection depending on the host. Um, and in some people, it causes asymptomatic infections or mild infections. And when, uh, while others suffer from moderate to severe and um, sometimes even lethal diseases. And this, Others also have acute disease that they can clear and recover from, while others suffer from long haul disease uh, that are suffering from you know, months of symptoms. And so currently we don't understand what dictates the outcome of COVID-19 disease in different individuals, but it certainly has uh, things to do with the host, such as the age, sex, uh, comorbidities, as well as pregnancy status, and other issues associated um, that might impact the immune system. So today I'm gonna to give you a couple of stories from my uh, own group that demonstrate the distinct immune responses that occur in moderate and severe diseases, as well as touch on a, uh, another story that has to do with um, potentially uh, long-term consequences that can occur from COVID-19 infection, which has to do with autoimmune disease. So the first story um, that I'd like to share with you was uh, led by these four amazing uh, trainees, uh, uh, Carolina Lucas, Patrick Wong, John Klein, and Tiago Castro. And this has to do with uh, longitudinal immune profiling of patients that came in through the Yale New Haven Hospital um, and their, their uh, virological and immunological analyses. So the way we in which we did this uh, study was to um, recruit patients who had uh, either moderate disease or severe disease. And these um, severe and moderate diseases were further divided into six different scores that we assigned depending on the amount of supplemental oxygen that people required during the hospital stay. Uh, from no oxygen uh, to six liter per minute uh, to mechanical ventilation and to death. Uh, in the case of uh, score six. And we also recruited uninfected healthcare workers at the same time to be able to compare their immune responses and immune cell types. 
So uh, by using multi-parametric flow cytometry analysis, what we noticed was that in COVID patients, especially uh, in the severe patients, we saw a uh, decline in the T cell, both percentage as well as number, uh, and also increase in inflammatory monocytes, um, as well as um, increase in the uh, appearance of these low density granulocytes, which are normally not found in the PBMC fraction, but are coming into this fraction in, in the case of COVID patients. Um, and these included neutrophils and eosinophils. And this really correlated with the disease severity. And what appears to distinguish the severe patient from the moderate patients uh, are the viral load in the nasopharynx that were monitored over time. So here in pink, I'm showing you uh, severe patients viral load from the nasopharyngeal swab over time in the hospital. And what, they, what you see is a maintenance of high load of virus. Whereas the moderate patients were able to clear the virus eventually to below the threshold of positivity. So this indicated that uh, there, there is this distinct feature associated with the severe disease maintaining this very high viral load. And we also saw that this viral load appears to be what's driving the interferon and cytokines um, and not the other way around. These antiviral cytokines such as type one interferon, interferon alpha or type two interferon, interferon gamma are not able to reduce the viral load but are driven by the viral load, which is shown here and on the x-axis uh, we're plotting the viral load and on the y-axis, the cytokine levels, and you see that there is a, a positive correlation between the viral load and the cytokines. And that extended to um, things like this inflammatory cytokine TNF and TRAIL. And we took this one step further and asked, what are the level of these cytokines within the first 12 days since central onset in patients who died of this infection, which are indicated in pink? and those who um, were discharged from the hospital live. So these are the navy um, circles here. And what you see is that there is an elevation of interferon alpha-2 as well as IL-1 receptor antagonist, uh, which is indicative of IL-1 receptor signaling uh, in the patients that have um, ultimately died of this infection. And those cytokines were elevated within the first 12 days of symptom onset. And we saw a, a similar trend of um, uh, elevated cytokines for other, um, other cytokines as well. And so this is a slide that I borrow from my lectures that I usually use for um, teaching immunology, because in our class, we teach that uh, distinct types of immune responses are induced depending on the type of pathogens that we encounter. For instance, for um, parasite response, we mount Th2 immunity. Uh, for viral and intracellular bacteria, we mount Th1 immunity. For antifungal immunity, we need Th17 cells um, and regulatory T cells in order to uh, suppress a hyperreactive immune response. And TFH is induced uh, for B cell help. And this is dictated by the interaction between the dendritic cells that presents the antigen to naive T cell and the fate of the T cells are dictated by the first order cytokines that are secreted by the dendritic cells that program these naive cell into these distinct types of um, effector lineage. However, uh, what we found with the severe COVID is that all of these arms of the immune system is engaged. So all of type one, type two, and type three immune responses are elevated um, as they progress through the disease. And again, this pink uh, indicates the severe patients and their levels of monocyte um, IL-12 interferon gamma uh, for the type one uh, immunity. For type two immunity, we're plotting things like eosinophils, eotoxin, IL-4, IL-5. These are the typical type two immune responses that are becoming elevated over time in the severe cases. Whereas in the moderate patients, they either stay low or um, just declining in some cases. And we also saw even elevated IgE levels, which is quite unusual for a antiviral immune response. 
Um, again, we saw all kinds of type three uh, immune uh, effector functions being uh, engaged in severe COVID as well. So we took the plasma cytokines and growth factors that are measured from the patients, um, both moderate and severe, and we asked whether they can be clustered based on these levels of the proteins, um, cytokines and growth factors that are found in the plasma. And it, essentially there was uh, three clusters of patients. So each of these columns are um, belong to a patient um, and each row represents different cytokines and growth factors uh, that are listed here. And what we saw was that the cluster one patients had an enrichment so the darker the color, the more um, higher the levels of these cytokines found in their plasma. Uh, cluster one patient really had an enrichment in tissue repair growth factors, um, EGF, VEGF, uh, IL-7, um, and so on, that are elevated in their plasma. The cluster two patients, in addition, had these um, elevated chemokines, as well as mixed cytokines that belong to all three effector arms. And then cluster three patients had a very dark um, uh, signal sear belonging to type two and three uh, effector function as well as mixed um, cytokines. And so what does this mean? Um, when you follow the trajectory of patients that belong in clusters one, two, and three, what we see is, is an interesting divide in that the cluster one patients they, um, they had uh, some clinical scores uh, to begin with, but they were able to reduce their clinical score and are, are discharged out of the hospital. Whereas cluster two and three patients, they had um, time-dependent elevation in the clinical scores, and they had uh, elevated um, uh, frequencies for coagulopathy and mortality compared to the cluster one patients indicating that these um, three clusters that were defined based on the plasma level of cytokines uh, really were revealing something uh, biologically relevant in that the first cluster of patients who had these tissue repair growth factors went on to recover from this infection while the other two clusters had worse disease outcome. And when we took all the parameters that we measured for all the patients and as for the biomarkers for COVID-19 mortality, what we detected is that the top biomarker, it turns out to be IL-18, which is a cytokine released as a result of inflammasome activation. Um, and the second top mortality um, biomarker was uh, interferon alpha itself. Uh, and then uh, other factors are listed here. So what these data showed us is that there is a persistent viral load that's detected from the severe disease patient. And this viral load is what appears to drive the interferon and cytokine responses. An increase in these levels of cytokines and interferons um, seen within the first 12 days of symptom onset uh, were elevated in, in the people who died of this infection. And there are four signatures of protein that distinguish patients who recover versus who go on to develop worse disease outcome. Um, and the, the worst um, outcome was found in the patients who developed these mixed cytokine responses, uh, and which we would consider them a maladaptive response to a viral infection. So putting this data in the context of uh, what we understand about uh, viral immunity in general, uh, we have a hypothesis that, you know, the earlier you can generate the interferon, the better outcome uh, it is for recovery from that infection. So here the viral load comes up and this person is able to generate interferon response and clear the virus, recover from a mild disease. And this might be happening in young individual as well as low viral exposure settings. On the other hand, patients uh, that we were studying, which is really this late time point, when we had this elevated interferon response um, with elevated viral load, this really is indicating that delayed interferon response is actually more harmful to the patient. Um, and that this is resulting in the severe disease that we see in older adults in high viral exposure settings. We also know from uh, work by John Laurent Casanova's group that there are patients who have deficiency in the genetic, um, um, genetic mutations in the genes that are involved in interferon 
um, signaling as well as induction. And those patients have very little interferon. Um, and in parallel, there are patients who have neutralizing antibodies to type 1 interferons who also have functionally very reduced interferon in their um, system. And in these settings, you have uncontrolled viral load and severe to lethal COVID that happen. And finally, uh, we, I don't think we're powerless against this virus. We can maybe interfere with all of these processes by injecting interferon early during this infection. And this has to be, uh, it's a little tricky because for this virus, the symptom only begins after the peak viral titer. So how do we catch this? Uh, we might have to think about prophylactic mechanisms for this, but essentially early interferon should lead to a better outcome. So in the last part, I wanted to just touch on um, our recent um, published work on autoantibodies in COVID. And this was really led by uh, an amazing colleague, Aaron Ring, who is in the same department as my, uh, I am, uh, with uh, his uh, trainees as well as uh, my trainees together led this work. And the impetus for this uh, looking for autoantibodies was that we know that in some patients, COVID-19 has very long lasting symptoms, as I mentioned earlier. And that involves uh, so many different organ systems. Um, and, and so we thought that perhaps uh, autoimmunity generated again against different um, tissue antigens might be driving these types of multi-organ uh, symptoms. So Dr. Ring's laboratory developed this um, new technology called Rapid Exocellular Antigen Profiling, or REAP, whereby he has generated a yeast display library um, encoding over 3,000 3, extracellular or secreted proteins from human that's displayed on the, on the surface. And so we can simply take our patient's serum um, and then add it to this um, yeast uh, library and pull out the ones that are being bound by the antibodies and to identify the autoantigens that are being recognized by patients. So using this REAP technology, we were able to uh, identify multiple diverse array of autoantigens that are found in COVID patients. And here again, each column is a patient and I've divided it into severe, moderate, mild to asymptomatic patients. And the, the, uh, the brighter the yellow, the more autoantibody there is in a patient. And each row represents an antigen. And the first thing you notice here is that this panel here uh, representing type one interferon and type three interferon, there's a lot of autoreactivity um, in the severe COVID patients, indicating that uh, this is really consistent with what John Laurent's group also showed that in the severe COVID patients, there is an enrichment for people with autoantibody to type one interferon. And uh, you can see that there are antibodies against all kinds of uh, immuno, immune cells as well as um, uh, other uh, inflammatory factors that are found. And, and so all these yellow boxes that you see are representing autoantibodies in the patient. And these autoantibodies to interferon uh, likely has a functional um, consequence because when we follow over time, the patients with these anti-interferon autoantibodies are unable to clear the viral load, whereas those patients that are matched with severity, um, sex, and age are able to um, you know, reduce the viral load over time, which who didn't have these autoantibody to interferon type one. In addition, there are many examples where we found that autoantibodies to cell surface markers for a variety of lymphocytes exists. And this is just showing some uh, evidence for patients who had autoantibody against B cell surface markers, um, they had very little B cells in circulation, and they also had no um, ability to mount an antibody against the SARS-CoV-2 RBD, indicating that functionally, these patients are defective uh, against uh, uh, in B cell response. In addition, we found a whole range of um, autoantibody against wide tissue antigen targets. So here, again, I won't have time to go through each of these antigens, but just to say that within the CNS, vascular connect connective tissues, saliva, skin, GI tract, and so on, there are these antigens that are being recognized by antibodies in the uh, serum from these COVID patients. Uh, and they may have functional consequences. We, we are cu currently trying to validate some of these hits. 
So this part of the, uh, the work demonstrated that there's diverse autoantibodies found in COVID patients. And some of these autoantibodies appear to be pre-existing, especially the ones against the interferons. Um, and these interferon type one autoantibody appear to uh, impair viral clearance in the patients. And there are other autoantibodies against immune cells that appear to diminish the number of these cells as well as their function. And there are these autoantibodies to tissue antigens that may contribute to significant um, tissue specific dysfunction. So um, I wanted to kind of end with this hypothesis uh, where um, we are seeing some long COVID uh, patients feeling better after vaccination. These are still, uh, the numbers are low and these are mostly patient-based groups reporting uh, 30 to 40% of the long haulers feeling better after vaccination. Um, these are not uh, uh, um, controlled trials or anything, but at least uh, reporting suggests that there's some benefit to vaccination. And um, so I, I believe that the long COVID can be caused by either persistent viral reservoir or um, autoantibody response or auto, autoimmune uh, T cell response. And vaccines may improve the long COVID symptom by either eliciting a robust antibody or T cell response that can target the viral reservoir or the innate um, stimulation by these um, mRNA vaccine, for example, the mRNA itself is a ligand for various viral sensors in the cell. And that can trigger cert, uh, cytokines and interferons that may uh, divert the autoreactive T cells and B cells uh, away from this, uh, the, the toxic effector functions that they're conducting. So um, trial and analyses of long haulers before and after the vaccination uh, will really provide the much needed insights into the disease as well as potential therapeutics uh, for the long COVID patients. So I will end here by thanking uh, my amazing lab members who are really working around the clock trying to understand immune response to COVID as well as implementing testing in the community. And I, none of this work could have been done without the Impact Yale team, which was established by the investigators uh, led by Dr. Albert Coe and many others listed here. And here are many other authors, which I didn't have time to acknowledge, who contributed to the work that I was able to describe today. So thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm gonna turn it all over to Angie. Well, thank you so much, uh, Akiko. And um, let me just get this set up here for sharing. And uh, hopefully this is full screen. If it's not, um, send me a, a chat and I will fix that. Um, but it's, it's always a tough act to follow Dr. Iwasaki, but I'm always glad to do so because I think that our work is actually really, really complimentary. And I'm pleased to see that since the last time I heard her speak, uh, I, I see that her hypothesis about the role of interferons and the host response actually hasn't changed that much and it still complements mine. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, since I study the, the host response to SARS coronavirus 2, and even though I am a virologist, um, I tend to focus on the role of the host uh, in viral infection and how that uh, host response contributes to disease. Um, but unlike Dr. Iwasaki, I'm not just focused on the immune system. I uh, focus on global host responses. I'm also going to talk a little bit about how we can use those uh, for, diagnos for diagnostics, prognostics, and potentially drug discovery as well. So before I get started, though, I'd like to begin with my territorial acknowledgement and equity statement. And today I'm in Seattle presenting from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Duwamish people. The work that I'm presenting today was performed on the lands of the Duwamish and Puyallup people here in Washington state, as well as the Lenape people of Manhattan Island. Um, I acknowledge and honor the first people of all these territories and their tribal governments, as well as their history in caring for these lands. And I'd also like to acknowledge that the long history of systemic inequity in academic science that really spans centuries. Uh, my prior institution where much of this work was done, Columbia University, and my current institution, Georgetown University, were both founded using profits from the transatlantic slave trade and the sale of enslaved people. 
And in addition, those institutions, as well as many others, excluded women and people of color from the academic community for more than 200 years. And this has really left a long and painful legacy of racial and gender-based inequality that continues to this day. So I encourage all of you to consider how you can contribute to making scientific research a more equitable enterprise going forward. And with that, I'm going to uh, begin by telling you about the approach that I take uh, when looking at these global host responses. So I use what's called a systems biology approach, um, but that doesn't really mean anything because if you ask any systems biologist what systems biology actually is, you're probably gonna get a different answer from each person. So this is kind of what this means to me. This is really an iterative uh, cyclic approach um, to developing hypotheses, testing them, uh, generating new hypotheses and then testing those. And we start with what uh, most of us would think of when we think of lab work, virology. Uh, so this is experimental models, whether that be cells in culture or animal models, um, you infect them with virus and you, you conduct normal virological, biochemical, uh, immunological studies on them. Then I use uh, these, these omics based approaches to, to kind of get a global lay of the land in terms of how the host is responding to that infection. Most often I use transcriptomic approaches or, or total RNA-seq uh, to look at the entire gene expression landscape uh, induced by the viral infection. We use bioinformatic and computational modeling approaches to make sense of all of that data. Uh, and then we can start to use that to develop hypotheses and also for some translational applications such as developing biomarker panels, identifying novel drug targets or looking for correlates of protection for vaccines. Uh, and really this combination of multiple experimental systems can address some really complex problems such as those involving the host response because the host response has a lot of different moving parts. Um, and really when you think of pathogenesis uh, and, and how viruses cause disease, there's really two sides to this story. On one hand, you have the virus and even uh, more complex RNA viruses like coronaviruses are still relatively small compared to the host in terms of their genome size, uh, the number of genes that, that are encoded um, and the function of those different proteins. Even though they're all very multifunctional, um, there are far fewer of them than in the host. And in this case, if the host is us, uh, that means we have a 3.2 billion base pair genome uh, that's organized into roughly 20,000 genes compared to a coronavirus's 26 genes. These genes are all organized uh, into multiple specialized pathways. They're expressed as multifunctional proteins in multiple isoforms. So the, the host side of things is very complex. Not to say that the virus side isn't complex. It, of course it is too, um, complex in a different way in some senses because of the simplicity of viruses relative to the host. Uh, but, but there's a lot of moving parts on both sides uh, of pathogenesis. Um, and that's what I'm gonna focus on. And we've known for a long time that host responses can determine pathogenicity. This is just two examples out of many. Um, influenza viruses, different influenza viruses uh, induce very different gene expression profiles. In Cinemogus macaques, in this case, infected with a seasonal flu versus a high pathogenicity avian H5N1 flu. Um, we see the same thing in Ebola virus, which is highly pathogenic in people versus Reston virus, which is not in macrophages. Um, so we, we can find these differences in, in the host gene expression programs that viral infection induces, and we can link this to pathogenicity. So how can we use this information to diagnose infection, predict outcome, or identify new therapeutic targets? Now, talking about SARS coronavirus 2, very early on uh, in the pandemic, so this came out, I think, last May, um, Ben Tenover's group at Mount Sinai did a really interesting study in which they looked at host responses in cell lines, in ferrets, and in COVID patients. Um, and what they found was that in the lungs, uh, SARS coronavirus 2 infection profoundly suppressed type 1 and type 3 interferon responses. They hypothesized that this uh, led to the, the cytokine storm that Dr. Iwasaki talked about a little bit. And we just saw how uh, the timing um, and magnitude of the interferon response is really important in determining ultimately uh, the clinical outcome. We also saw from this work uh, in Ben's lab that, that SARS coronavirus 2 really does induce unique host response profiles compared to influenza A, for example. Um, this is both in terms of the overall transcriptomic landscape, as well as the types of pathways that are being induced. So, so it really is fundamentally different from other viral infections, including other viral pathogens that infect the respiratory tract. So I decided to take a look at this in the rhesus macaque model. And this was developed by my collaborators at NIH Rocky Mountain Labs, 
Uh, this was Emmy DeWitt and Vincent Munster's work in which they infected rhesus macaques with SARS coronavirus 2. These animals uh, develop um, observable lung lesions that, that can be seen at necropsy as well as by uh, histopathology. You can also identify areas of infiltration uh, by x-rays. Um, and in this case though, we looked at the whole blood. So, so the disease is occurring in the, the respiratory tract in the lungs. Um, this is a model of moderate COVID-19. So these animals don't actually get that sick, uh, but they also don't have any virus in their blood. Um, so we looked at blood samples. So this is really looking at systemic responses rather than the responses of the cells that are directly infected. And what we found, um, and I'm gonna go through this very quickly, is basically this is pretty typical of non-human primate experiments. When you're looking at the overall transcriptome, there's a lot of, of noise basically um, with what we're seeing. And we saw most of the gene expression um, between days one, three, and five post-infection, uh, this, this peak of gene expression at day 12 is probably driven by one or two animals. This is because these uh, macaques are, are quite genetically distinct from each other. So we normally expect to see a lot of inter-animal variation, um, but we can still find some pretty good information from looking at the early time points in these animals uh, in terms of what's being upregulated, downregulated, and how these are all uh, shaking out in terms of the biology that's going on. So what we saw in the blood, and again, these animals have no virus in their blood. So this is looking at the response, the systemic responses of cell or not the upregulation in interferon, inflammatory genes and interferon stimulated genes. This really suggests that uh, systemically there's a rapid response uh, in this model. And again, this is consistent with what Dr. Iwasaki was talking about in that uh, people who have a rapid interferon response typically have a more desirable disease outcomes. They have less severe disease. Um, that's really consistent with what we're seeing in these macaques. The serum cytokines from these animals were consistent with our findings. And also we see similar things in terms of the immune cells that are driving these responses. Early on, we see increased myeloid and phagocytic cells, uh, but we, see, we don't see sustained levels of this. So this is consistent with these uh, types of cells that are being mobilized to go to the site of infection and, and clear it. We also over time see an increase in plasmacytoid dendritic cells that are very specialized to uh, secrete large amounts of type one interferons. So we see again in this moderate model of COVID-19 disease that uh, we are seeing rapid and robust interferon responses um, along with controlled inflammatory responses. And that might be linked to this moderate disease outcome. Um, so this is consistent also with what's been observed in human patients. Uh, this is another study from last year in which they looked at patients with different levels of disease severity, and they specifically looked at interferon and ISGs in the peripheral blood of these patients. And they found that uh, patients who had severe or critical COVID-19 had far fewer interferon uh, and interferon stimulated genes um, being expressed. And this was pretty significant compared to mild and moderate. So my hypothesis, uh, again, agrees with Dr. Iwasaki's in that um, these systemic interferon responses, their timing and their magnitude probably determine disease severity. Um, so while in the lungs, the cells that are directly infected, you will see interferon suppression, and this is a normal feature of most viral infection, you will then see severe or increased inflammation in those tissues. Systemically in mild and moderate disease, you will see these early rapid interferon responses and controlled inflammation that lead to viral clearance in the infected tissue. Uh, and in severe cases, you would see suppressed interferon responses or delayed interferon responses along with uncontrolled inflammation. Now we do need to test this hypothesis in animal models of differential COVID-19 severity. So that's something that uh, I plan to do once I get settled in at my new institution. Now I'm gonna talk briefly about how we can take some of this data and combine it with data that's already in the public domain or data that, that in this case I generated uh, with my collaborators prior to the pandemic and make some more use out of it. So prior to the pandemic occurring, I was working on a project with Vincent Munster and Dick Bowen and Ben Garcia looking at tolerance, what we call tolerance in MERS coronavirus uh, infection. And this is basically why some species uh, or some individuals get MERS and have very mild disease, or wh whereas some others uh, end up developing very severe disease. And we looked at this across multiple species. We have a dose-dependent model of tolerance in mice. 
Uh, we also looked at marmosets, which develop severe and lethal disease, as well as dromedary camels and alpacas, which are tolerant to MERS infection. Um, and then we took, we did this same type of transcriptomic work. And then we decided that we wanted to use machine learning approaches to try to predict outcome. So the way that this works is you take host gene expression profiles from these animal models. You go through these gene expression profiles and you iteratively pick these features, in this case, genes that are upregulated or downregulated, and you see how they perform in a model um, as, as far as being able to classify a particular outcome. So we wanted to know if we could take host response data from animal models and use it to predict outcome in human patients. And when we we did this with the mouse model of MERS that I just described. Um, we found that we were able to predict outcome about 90% of the time correctly. Um, but again, this is in mice. How would this work in people? Um, well, we already did this also with Ebola virus. So we have another model of differential Ebola virus disease that's a panel of genetically diverse mice called the collaborative cross. In that model, we were able to predict uh, Ebola outcome um, with almost 100% performance. Um, using the mouse data alone. Then we took a data set that was available publicly that looked at West African Ebola patients, uh, 24 of whom survived Ebola virus disease and 88 of whom were fatal cases. This had already been used by the people who published this to, to use a similar approach to predict outcome. And they did so with about 79 to 85% accuracy, depending on what algorithm they were using. So we used this um, to test the, the model we had trained on our map. And we found that it predict outcome correctly about 75% of the time, which is good in terms of proof of principle, probably not good enough for the clinic. Um, but once we added data from non-human primate data set that came out of work that we did with Tom Geisbert at the University of Texas Medical Branch Galveston National Labs, uh, we were able to boost that performance up to about 90, 96%. Uh, so we were able to correctly predict outcome 96% of the time if we were using data from mice, from monkeys, and from people. So we thought this was a pretty good indication that we might be able to, to take data from other coronavirus models uh, and supplement the, the limited amount of data that we have for SARS coronavirus 2 and, and MERS coronavirus with other bits of data. I've also been working with Michael Kirby at Colorado State University, and he's a mathematician and has made these sort of bespoke machine learning models that can classify people uh, and, and whether or not they're going to shed virus and in, uh, infections um, right down to the, the hour at which they begin shedding with several different viruses. So we know that, that this can be done. We've been able to do it now with our animals and with humans. Uh, Michael has been able to do it in his group um, using these custom uh, approaches. So we plan to do this uh, in terms of coronavirus pathogenicity, and, and this hasn't been done yet, but it's in store. So the idea here is that we would take uh, transcriptomic data from uh, the MERS coronavirus animal models that I was talking to you about, uh, from the SARS coronavirus 2 animal models that I just told you about, uh, as well as some others that are in the public domain, and then uh, mix these up with data that's there already from other highly pathogenic uh, beta coronavirus infections. So SARS classic, MERS, SARS-CoV-2 that are in databases like GEO. And by developing these pan coronavirus classification signatures, we can not only maybe predict pathogenicity haven't even been discovered yet, but we might also be able to predict, you know, the wildlife, whether there are even competent human pathogens at all. So we think this really does have pretty good applications in terms of pandemic preparedness, as well as uh, developing prognostics for future coronavirus pandemics or other virus pandemics. And the, the nice thing about working on the host response is that in this case, when you're dealing with a human host, the host never changes. It's just the virus that changes. So if we can find some common threads between viruses that have similar features or are related to one another, um, we think that this will have applications long beyond uh, the, the current pandemic. Okay, so as I said, my, my grand scheme of things is to integrate this data across these different platforms, uh, experimental platforms, as well as these different pathogens and kind of develop universal mechanisms of susceptibility and tolerance and predict pathogenicity or protection across species. Uh, and I think that I'm getting a little notice that I need to start wrapping up. So I'm just going to um, 
go very quickly through the upstream analysis and drug repurposing work that we've also done. So the idea behind upstream analysis and drug repurposing is that you take the transcriptomic data that you're seeing, but it's even though it's a great way to look at global responses, it's not necessarily a very good way to uh, to see what's not being regulated transcriptionally. So if something is upstream and, and is responsible for this downstream gene expression pattern, um, you might not see it in your transcriptomic data. So we use a different uh, module of our functional analysis software that predicts what these upstream regulators are so that you can identify them even if they're not showing up in your transcriptomic data set. And we've done this again with our Ebola model um, where we were looking for upstream regulators that are drugs that would either inhibit signatures associated with lethality or activate signatures associated with tolerance. And we identified uh, four different drugs that met this criteria, including corticosteroids. Um, then we confirmed this with another uh, database just to make sure that, that this wasn't an artifact of the particular software that we were using. And we found again that these corticosteroids were, were identified. So we tested this in the mouse model that we have. And while it wasn't necessarily something that you would, would recommend that people with Ebola go out and start taking dexamethasone, we did find that we could uh, observe a delay, a significant delay in progression to death, as well as a delay in onset of clinical symptoms. So, oops, sorry about that. Um, so we thought this was a good proof of principle. We've since done that, that with our MERS coronavirus data, and we were very pleased to see that dexamethasone, again, popped out of this. Um, and as many of you know, uh, dexamethasone is one of the few treatments that does seem to work for SARS coronavirus too. So just finishing up here, um, we identified dexamethasone when we also looked at this with both the MERS data across these multiple species, as well as SARS coronavirus 2 data uh, from ferrets, from human lung autopsies and biopsies, as well as the macaque data that I showed you earlier. Um, so that, that was, again, really good proof of principle. Tocilizumab, which has also been shown to have a clinical benefit, also popped up here. So did beta estradiol, which uh, may be important in terms of explaining some of the sex biases that have been observed in SARS coronavirus 2. So this is very crude early days of this. Uh, but again, I just wanted to show you because I think that there's going to be a lot of potential uh, once we start integrating these data sets across different models of uh, beta coronavirus infection. So um, that's just kind of what I've depicted here. Uh, and I hope that I've convinced you that you can use animal model systems and uh, interrogation of host responses to look at many, many different aspects of pathogenesis. And there are many applications in terms of pandemic preparedness and response, including for wildlife, livestock and agriculture, companion animals, and of course, people. Um, and with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my many collaborators uh, and um, look forward to discussing this all on the panel. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to hand it over to Peter. Hi, uh, thanks. And so let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, so let me just start by saying, um, uh, besides saying I'm Peter Lee, I um, was really impressed uh, with uh, both uh, Akiko and Angie's presentations and learned a lot. So really appreciate uh, the work they're doing. and. Um, uh, I clearly need to follow up um, with both of them. Um, what I wanted to do um, here is talk a little bit about the data analysis and particularly the use of machine learning and AI um, and where that is going and maybe some um, both current and a little bit more future-oriented implications. If we just take a step back and think back over the past year, um, data has been pretty important in outbreak response. Um, of course, everyone, the whole world has become very uh, attached to looking at the data modeling and forecasting work. Uh, and there have been many prominent organizations around the world um, that have been involved in that. If you look at the CDC leaderboard uh, today, uh, there are I think 56 or 57 uh, such uh, uh, forecasting models, uh, typically forecasting uh, mortality and uh, hospitalization rates, infection rates. Um, uh, most of them are based uh, in one form or another of uh, SEIR, classical models, uh, epidemiological models. Uh, but if you look at the uh, typically the most accurate model, at least uh, for two week uh, into the future forecasts, uh, it's a Microsoft model that uh, actually is not based on SEIR, 
um, but is based on an ensemble of recurrent neural nets. And um, it, that tends even to beat uh, the combination model that the CDC uh, aggregates uh, from, uh, from uh, all the others. Um, and the use of recurrent neural nets, the use of machine learning shouldn't be too much of a surprise, but what's really interesting about that is it allows you then predictively to understand, well, if you were to impose specific restrictions like uh, a ban on bars and restaurants or a ban on large sporting events, it allows you to play forward uh, the implications of that. And so machine learning has turned out to be uh, important in that space. Um, there has been, of course, a tremendous amount of work to bring AI and machine learning uh, into both public health operations and into healthcare delivery. Um, uh, you know, patient number one in the U.S. Uh, happened here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, was treated uh, by the Providence Health System. Um, and, you know, there were immediately a lot of uh, predictive analytics and trend analysis machine learning problems um, that they brought forward. Uh, since they saw clearly uh, that there might be a crisis looming here. Uh, and even things like uh, understanding the pre-positioning and the need for things like um, uh, PPE uh, ended up being machine learning problems. In the public health space, um, th there has been quite a bit of work. Um, you know, the Microsoft Health Bot that was worked on with Providence and the CDC um, ended up being deployed at about 3,100 uh, ho hospitals and health systems around the world uh, and several governments. It uh, provided a very detailed machine learning in order to measure and do an agile response to ensure that, um, uh, for example, that uh, huge crowds weren't being brought into emergency departments or into nurse call centers. Uh, even just slight word changes uh, were determined in part by machine learning. Um, and then um, finally, uh, and I think the main subject of this session uh, has been about uh, research acceleration uh, through uh, the better ability to extract insight and knowledge from data. Uh, and there's been a tremendous amount here. Um, and I you know, want to point out that it's not just an understanding immune system response, it's not just understanding uh, the molecular modeling and accelerating molecular dynamic simulations through machine learning, but even things like uh, AI powered chatbots that were deployed by companies like Walgreens uh, ended up directing important numbers of people to key clinical trials. And so there was uh, sort of a impact of AI uh, at several different levels. Um, but the thing I thought I would focus on first here um, is more on uh, our understanding of immune system response. Um, and I decided to focus on the just knowing uh, the other two panelists. Uh, it's also a little bit daunting because I'm a computer scientist by training and Microsoft, of course, is a, uh, is a computer technology company. Um, and yet what we found is that we were drawn into uh, many of these research efforts around the world um, simply because of the need to apply more advanced machine learning to, to the problems. Um, have... One of the projects we worked on um, that was started in November was with Adaptive Biotechnologies, which is a Seattle biotech company. Um, and uh, they had uh, you know, an idea and we had an ongoing project that we had been working on with them for the past two and a half years um, that was applying machine learning to the uh, understanding of T cell receptor repertoires. Um, and in fact, in November, um, uh, the ongoing diagnostic targets for that project were suspended. Uh, and instead, the total effort was directed to, to seeing whether there could be some sort of diagnostic support for COVID-19 uh, using the, the, these techniques. So what is this about? Well, the overall goal of the project was to develop a platform for T-cell-based multiplex diagnostics. And the specific goal in this project was to compute or impute a person's HLA types. Because HLAs present peptides to the T-cell receptors and the HLAs are highly polymorphic, we expected uh, an individual's HLA types to shape in a profound way uh, the T-cell receptor repertoire. And so in fact, if we train 
our so-called type two models to predict specific HLA alleles using TCR repertoires, uh, we do find a pretty small signal. And so um, here's an example, uh, in fact, then, uh, for uh, A0201. So the procedure is pretty simple as a first cut. You take the first pass uh, through the data and identify T cell receptors that are in some sense statistically associated with the A0201 expression. And then you take a second pass and just simply count up how many A0201 associated T cell receptors a person has. And so that's plotted along the Y axis and then compare that to the overall diversity along the X axis. And what you can see here uh, on, on this chart is that this dead simple approach, it's just simple counting, there's no machine learning going on here, uh, yields uh, almost perfect separation. Now, um, you know, this small training set of just in this particular example that I'm showing of 630 HLA type repertoires, uh, we can get nearly perfect prediction for many of the alleles at all the classic class one and class two uh, locations. And this is useful for a couple of reasons. First, any case control cohort that looks at TLS receptors should control for HLA types. And so with this approach, we can precisely construct appropriate control sets. And then second, this set of alleles includes many that are epidemiologically linked to autoimmune diseases. And so when we look at, for example, DQ2.5 haplotype, which is linked to celiac disease, um, or B27, which is linked to uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, um, and so on, uh, we have a direct estimate of genetic risk for these diseases um, through this uh, method. But perhaps most of all, you know, what we're seeing is that we expect clear signal um, and we are in fact seeing it. So that's uh, comforting. Now, what I've shown here was training directly from the repertoires. Um, and that's just, as I said, a dead simple thing, but in fact, this particular plot was just from one fold in a cross-validation run and specifically uh, trained on 503 repertoires. And now this chart is showing the results on 127 repertoires of the test set. It turns out though, that we can get nearly comparable accuracy with a so-called N of zero experiment in which we train on zero repertoires and test on all 630. Now, how is that possible? Well, we do this by, of course, using other data, specifically antigen-specific T cell receptors. Our specific approach is, first of all, to use uh, a, an assay at adaptive biotechnologies called MIRA to identify T cell receptors that bind relevant antigens then we learn the antigen specific models. And then finally, we can scan the repertoires in the test set for TCRs that are predicted to bind to those antigens. And it turns out that if we choose the right epitopes, we can get a very strong signal. Now, in this case, we have only three epitopes chosen, the well-studied AO201 restricted immunodominant epitopes for CMV, uh, for EBV and influenza. And I'm guessing that almost everyone uh, in this audience today has had uh, an infection uh, or been vaccinated uh, against at least one of these viruses. And so if you express A0201, for example, there's a very good chance you will target the epitopes put into these models. Um, and as you can see, we get pretty close to perfect positive predictive value. Um, and the only real limitation is for some individuals who uh, apparently either weren't affected by one of these viruses or, or mounted a non-standard response. Now, um, coming back to COVID-19, uh, prior to the pandemic a year ago, uh, starting with this concept, uh, we started to look at other more complicated diagnostic targets uh, at celiac disease, at Lyme disease, um, at several cancers. And the reason that we felt that this was interesting is that uh, we would be able to generate very large amounts of label training data for our machine learned models. 
we would not, for example, in the case of Lyme disease or a celiac disease model, need to find extremely large numbers of patients affected by those diseases. Uh, we would need just, we estimated on the order of two to 3,000 affected patients. Uh, and then we'd be able to use this approach to boost dramatically the strength of the signal and the accuracy of the models uh, using naive samples. And so that was the program that we've been on. And in fact, for several of those disease targets, um, quite a bit of progress was made. Then uh, we hit uh, the, uh, uh, the pandemic. Um, and with the pandemic, a decision was made to suspend uh, those efforts uh, temporarily uh, and focus uh, entirely on COVID-19. Um, and that commenced at the beginning of November. And last week, um, we received the emergency use uh, authorization for the T-detect test based on this principle uh, for COVID-19. Um, and that test uh, provides very high specificity and sensitivity uh, for current or past COVID-19 uh, disease or uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection um, uh, up to 120 days out. Now, taking a step back, I just wanted to comment a little bit about this sort of uh, machine learning or AI-based approach. Um, and let me just start by saying um, about the, making a comment about the dependence on data. And this is something that came up um, in both of the previous talks. Um, you know, if we think abstractly, uh, there's this thing called intelligence, uh, and then there's a field of artificial intelligence, and it's not known today whether artificial intelligence, machine intelligence is a proper subset of the notion of intelligence or not, but um, there's some coverage there. Um, machine learning, of course, is a very small subset of the, of the concept of artificial intelligence. And then within machine learning, there's yet a smaller subset, uh, which is the idea of building self-improving machines uh, that improve uh, through the use of data. Uh, and then an even smaller portion of that is what we would call supervised machine learning. And supervised machine learning basically is data that has been labeled through human intelligence. And uh, sometimes we talk about that being the digital exhaust of human, uh, human intelligence. Uh, and for the most part, almost everything that is done in industrial research today in commercial application in AI is based on supervised machine learning. What has been happening though, is that there has been a revolution of practical application and scale in broadening from that red dot to that full orange dot, to being able to learn from data in an unsupervised way. Uh, and one of the examples of this has been happening in natural language processing. Um, and so to explain how that's been working, uh, let me show this test. Um, this is a very simple fill in the blank test where you're supposed to guess the right word um, that belongs here. Um, and this is in uh, linguistics is referred to as a closed test, C-O-L-Z-E. Closed tests end up being very interesting because what you can do is you can form these closed tests. So just gather all the text in any language from every digital source you can, the entire World Wide Web, uh, any other place, um, run it through a pre-trained multi-layer transformer uh, to extract a contextualized representation that allows you to make a prediction or an attempt at filling in the blank. Uh, when you fill in the blank, um, of course, then you're able to assess uh, how well uh, you've done. Um, and since we formed the tests, you know, we created these blanks from all the gathered text, uh, we're able to compute the loss uh, based on that ground truth and feed that loss back into an improvement of the multi-layer transformer. And so with this process, what we're able to do is set in motion a process of training an extremely large machine learned neural model without any human intelligence supervision. We can just have a machine that say scoops up all of the text on the internet, just randomly constructs every possible closed test uh, and then uh, run this loop. Uh, 
Um, and um, today there are, uh, of course, uh, quite a few academic researchers working on this. And there are two companies, Microsoft and Google, that have been working uh, very hard to scale up uh, the, uh, the size of the neural model, sort of the parameter space uh, involved here. And so here uh, you can see um, what's been publicly disclosed. In fact, this is a little bit of date because uh, Google just uh, publicly disclosed their 1.6 trillion parameter model. Um, but you know, we're rapidly approaching uh, the multiple trillion parameter models. And this is to give you a sense of the size of the neural nets, um, roughly one order of magnitude less than the, say, the number of neurons in a, an animal like an octopus. Um, now, there's been a lot of question about whether there's any hyper-reality, and some of that's fed by some of the, the stunts that people show. Uh, one stunt is, um, you know, you give, you know, four lines of Shakespeare uh, to GPT-3, and then it just, you know, generates uh, original text in the same style. Um, or uh, just out of the box, GPG-3 is able to just engage in uh, reasonably intelligent uh, Q&A uh, with the human being. Uh, and furthermore, um, by doing a little bit of small task-specific training, you're able to get remarkably good performance out of these extremely large neural models for non-language tasks like image processing. Um, this has been very important in the past year in being able to look at even clinical tasks, uh, texts and be able to extract uh, the meaning of, of uh, clinical, uh, clinical notes uh, with uh, remarkably little training, almost no training at all. Uh, but perhaps most interesting uh, has been the application of extremely large neural models uh, to fundamental uh, questions in biology. Um, and um, the DeepMind folks made quite a bit of news with AlphaFold. Um, but in fact, there has been here also an arms race, you know, where the use of deep neural nets uh, in order to do the static uh, prediction of the static configuration of uh, energy minimum configurations of proteins uh, has been underway. Um, and as the neural models have been expanding in size, the accuracy or the similarity between the predicted and native structure of proteins uh, has been improving along with it. And again, this is really happening in part through a transfer learning effect uh, from even from the, the natural language processing models. Um, and while the model that DeepMind used for this is big. It, it's actually two orders of magnitude smaller uh, than the actual hyperscale neural models uh, that, are, that are currently underway uh, in both Microsoft and Google. And so when you play that forward and if you want to see you know, how far away we may be from being able to use machine learning, say, instead of of uh, molecular dynamic simulations in order to get a dynamic folding model. Uh, we're already uh, within a few hundred GPU years um, of capability today. Um, and with the next generation of models, uh, we may be uh, much closer than that. And so I think if anything, what we've seen is that the use of machine learning AI has been very important um, today in the response to the pandemic, but the acceleration of application of this to problems in medicine and biology in the future uh, look to me to be uh, even more important. Uh, so with that, um, uh, I will stop sharing and uh, hand it back to our, our moderators. Okay, uh, I'm trying to get my video back up. And see if we can do that. Uh, okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, I don't know any AI scientists who could also present immunology. So you got to get special recognition for that. Uh, and um, really, uh, great presentations, Kiko and Angie. I mean, this is phenomenal substrate for us to discuss it. I want to bring along uh, my colleague, Christian Anderson, for the panel, who has been doing, I, I think everyone knows, quite a bit of work in, in the genomic sequencing and 
trying to understand um, where we're headed with variants and, and, and so much more. So Christian, welcome. Um, best recruit I ever made in my career was getting Christian here from the Broad Institute, uh, by the way. So let me start things off and we'll take questions uh, from uh, our, our participants. But, um, you know, both uh, Akiko and Angie, you, you really delved into the interferon story quite a bit. And what's striking to me is that we've known about this. You've added a lot to the knowledge base, but we still don't have interferon as an early therapy, either prophylactically or, you know, even at the earliest contact with someone with known COVID. And so uh, it's really seems to me we, we've had so much work done on uh, other drugs, but why haven't we made some headway in the interferon story? And the, if you could also comment with those 10% or so people that have autoantibodies, would an inhalation of beta interferon, which is basically a repurposed drug, would it override that concern? So maybe Akio, can you start with that? Yeah, absolutely. So as with all the other drugs, um, interferon has been tried in large uh, randomized clinical trials. And um, as Angie really impressed upon us too, that, that there's a really uh, important need to give the interferon early. Um, otherwise we might be harming uh, the people. And in fact, if you look at the recovery trial, um, which included all patients, uh, including people who had, who had severe disease, uh, with treatment with interferon, they did not see any uh, benefit for, mm -hmm. for that large uh, cohort. And in fact, uh, in, in some severe patient, it may have been actually a little bit more harmful than the placebo group. So I, but, but on the other hand, there are other trials that uh, included only uh, mild patients or mo moderate early disease phase. And those uh, trials are showing some benefit so I think we really need to uh, hone in on the right timing and the right stage of the disease. Uh, in particular, you know, prophylactic uh, inhaled interferon might be a really good thing to pursue in the future, especially for people who are in a high risk category, uh, healthcare workers who are treating COVID patients and so on. And uh, this can be even applied to other types of you know, respiratory viruses. And just to get to the interferon beta treatment of people who have anti-type type 1 interferon autoantibodies. So we haven't seen anyone who actually developed antibody against interferon beta. All of these uh, people are making interferon alpha um, uh, isoforms, um, as well as some for interferon lambda, but fortunately, we have not seen any that made interferon beta. So I think that's a really nice um, kind of idea, Eric, that we might be able to treat people without knowing their autoantibody status, uh, potentially with interferon beta early. Yeah, for sure. Nice to get that into high gear, Fa you know, fast track it. Angie, anything to add on that? I don't really have anything to add. I mean, I think that one thing that that has always come up in every data set I've ever looked at is that even in the cases of severe disease, if you look at a later time point, you always see tons and tons of interferon. Um, and I think a lot of people find that surprising because it's always thought that interferon antagonism is something that leads to pathogenesis, but it's not so much that there's no interferon at all. It's just that the timing of the interferon is not right. So I completely agree with Akiko that probably early treatment is the way to do it. And that, that would explain why you don't see an effect when you're looking at patients who are already very severely ill. Um, I think that prophylactic interferon is an interesting idea, especially if it's inhaled, because the only other thing to consider about that is that interferon is expensive. And it also um, is when given IV anyways, it's not well tolerated at all. And I did my, my PH or my postdoc work you know, on hepatitis C virus. And I'm old enough that when I was doing that, uh, the, the primary treatment for HCV was a pegylated interferon and ribavirin. And for genotype one infections anyways, it was so ineffective that most clinicians were not even prescribing it to their patients because it, it caused such serious reductions in quality of life unless they showed signs of progressive liver disease. So I think that, that if you can 
get interferon in a form that would be tolerable um, for use as a prophylactic, I think that's a really interesting uh, that's a really interesting approach to take. Um, otherwise, I think though that that early treatment is going to be the way to go with interferon. Right now, you know, each of you have so many multi-dimensional uh, contributions you made during the pandemic, which we could get into, and I, we won't have time. But I do want to get to Peter because last time we spoke, um, he and I were comparing notes about convalescent plasma. Yes. And for those of you who don't know, Microsoft was like the backbone of the national convalescent plasma. Over 500,000 Americans received convalescent plasma. Uh, so maybe, can you just give a little bit of perspective about that, Peter, and, and kind of your latest uh, sense of where that is going or has been? Yeah, it's been um, quite an odyssey. And I sometimes think 10 years from now, I'll look back on this with some combination of post-traumatic stress and <laughs> and pride, I, uh, uh, it is kind of amazing and really credit to the people at Mayo Clinic and Meyer, Johns Hopkins and so on, because they sort of spearheaded an early access protocol that you know enrolled the first 100,000 patients or so. Um, you know, I think that um, the medical science is difficult. Here, you know, it's a subtle thing. Um, there definitely appears to be uh, very little benefit uh, in, in late disease progression. So again, it, it's something that, if if it's to be effective, needs to be done uh, early. I, I think there's no controversy about safety, um, but but then um, other factors. For example, the recovery trial, uh, which was given up, you know, there 92 percent of those patients uh, were also being administered steroids. And so there seems to be some bad interaction between uh, application of steroids with convalescent plasma. And the more that we've sort of delved into the data, the more complicated the situation has, has become. Um, and yet there are other RCTs, uh, you know, where there's extremely strong efficacy signal and so I, I would say that it's something that, um, you know, after some trials and tribulations, the FDA landed in the right spot with this, which is it's a fairly narrow, the EUA is fairly narrowly specified uh, for early application of relatively high titer convalescent plasma. Um, and depending on whether we end up being in real trouble with variants, then kind of locally sourced, where local means not only geographically, but also time-wise, uh, source convalescent plasma could rise in importance. Um, but, you know, it's been an incredibly complex uh, matter. Um, one last thing to say is Microsoft, what the heck is Microsoft doing uh, with this? Um, and what happened there was, you know, we had successfully worked with the CDC on the um, self-triage, self-assessment uh, protocols and bots and, you know, uh, the whole tech industry helped distribute that. And so there was a, a request to work with FDA on doing something similar to encourage people to find out if they would be viable donors of convalescent plasma. Um, and when we got involved in that, it seemed like a straightforward application of our technology. Um, and we quickly found out that, well, you know, the plasma, the fractionators in the pharmaceutical industry and the blood banks and the American Red Cross and the White House Coronavirus Task Force, they don't all exactly get along. And Microsoft found itself by accident as sort of the neutral intermediary. Um, and I think our last phone call, Eric, I was frankly trying to get advice from you how to extract myself from the situation. And, uh, and of course, you know, uh, we we couldn't drop the ball on that, and um, here we are, about five hundred, I think, about five hundred seventy thousand patients later. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. when well, just the recovery was published uh, the preprint yesterday, and you know, really, um, unfortunately, not showing the benefit that many of us had hoped to see. Let's go over to Christian, and maybe can you start the discussion on the variants? That's obviously a principal concern of ours right now. Uh, I know it's going to be a topic of 60 minutes this Sunday, and uh, maybe you can you can 
you can talk us through about what you're thinking about the major variants and the, the overall topic. Sure. I mean, I think the, the first thing is probably to just identify what do we actually mean when we talk about variants, because I think there, there's a lot of confusion about variants. Which ones should we care about? Which ones shouldn't we care about? And the fact is that SARS-CoV-2, like all other viruses, mutate all the time, which means there are variants, if you want to call them, that, that, are, that arise all the time. And the vast majority of these we don't care about. The trick is to figure out, well, of all the ones we don't care about, which ones should we actually care about? And I think as of late, I think there's been a lot of confusion around that because there are three main ones. There's the one first identified in the UK, B117, one first identified in South Africa, the B1351, and then the, the one first identified in Brazil, which is P1. And what we have observed about all of these is that given a set of selection pressures and some constellation of mutations, there are versions of SARS-CoV-2 which might be have a higher fitness, might essentially spread better in a population than other versions of, of SARS-CoV-2. And that's exactly what we observed with the variants. And we have on the one side, again, the B117 from UK, for example, is inherently more transmissible and was simply selected for the purpose of saying, well, the virus that transmits better in a population is going to rise in frequency. And that's exactly what we have seen from that. And we are now seeing that being widespread um, all across the world, including here in the United States, it is becoming widespread. The other two are think a little different. I think they, they originated, emerged in areas of the world where you have very high attack rates, or they're called the very, uh, very uh, big outbreaks in the spring of last year. And these variants have now found themselves very successful in, in these environments. And I think the selection pressure there, while it might also be transmission, I think might have to do more with their ability to cause, for example, slightly higher rates of, of reinfections because they have some immunization properties. It's never complete. It doesn't mean that if you have been infected with vanilla SARS-CoV-2, everybody will now be uh, affected by these or infected with these new variants. But I do think that it's a different mechanism in which we have seen these actually become, become uh, dominant in the regions where they're first identified. So um, I guess to say the B117, you, you uh, and a whole bunch of collaborators just put out a paper and I know it's a preprint, I know it's in press, uh, it's going to become dominant in the United States. And uh, will, will it outrun these other uh, variants that are associated with the immune evasion, like the, the P1 and B1351? And also, uh, do, are you confident that um, we'll get through this? <laughs> We will get through this, but let me make that clear. But, but you know, getting through this means we actually need to do something actively, right? I mean, Texas is done with COVID-19, but I can guarantee you that, that COVID-19 is not done with Texas, right? That's not the approach you want to follow here. I think B117, I do think, will in the short term become the dominant one in the United States over the next uh, month or two, maybe. Uh, how it's going to compete with these other variants, we don't really know. And it also really depends on immune status in the population. If we look at the other ones in the United Kingdom, they don't seem to be competing uh, very well with B117. B117 has one out there. Uh, so I think we're going to see the same occurring here. And what I think is really important, and this is what our paper shows, is that we would like to think of the United States as being special and all the stuff that happens in other countries are not going to happen here, right? But here's the sad truth is that we aren't special. If you look at the, the growth properties of this variant in the United States, it's exactly the same as we see in the United Kingdom, in Portugal, in Denmark, in Jordan, and many other places. So yes, we should expect this to become dominant uh, pretty soon, and we'll see in ri uh, rising cases as a result of it. I wonder, uh, Akiko, if you could comment about the immune escape of the variants and uh, the, the potential of a variant that we're starting to get a sense of in New York, which combines the features of B117 in the UK and adds this EEC, E484 onto it to make it kind of the worst case scenario potentially. What's your sense about uh, how the vaccines will do with these, uh, these variants that have some immune evasion property? <laughs> 
Yes. Uh, so, yeah, the, the variants that you're talking about clearly has uh, some evidence that are reducing the ability of um, immune responses generated by the wild type virus or the vaccine to confer protection. So th that is really a concern. Um, and then, you know, by combining, so these mutations that are arising that es seems to escape the antibodies arising in multiple places, um, you know, uh, independently. And, and that again shows that, you know, th these things are being selected because they're able to um, infect people even if they had uh, some level of uh, existing immunity. And so I do worry about these uh, variants arising both with respect to increased transmission rate as well as uh, potentially you know, making these vaccines less effective. Um, there is still cross-reactive uh, immunity generated by most of these vaccines against the variants. And most of these vaccines appear to do a really good job of preventing severe disease and, and lethal diseases. So it's still very important to take the vaccines, um, no matter you know, what variants are out there. And hopefully vaccines that incorporate the, the variant sequence will also become available to really provide that, you know, really high effective um, uh, protection against these variants. And Angie, you also comment about this topic and, and also that, you know, not much, you know, Peter brought up the T cell tests that they've developed with adaptive. We don't really think about that when we think about immune escape, it's all kind of the neutralizing antibody story. Can you, can you um, pull that together? Yeah, so this is something I think about a lot actually, because I think that people have assumed that neutralizing antibody function is a correlate of protection uh, for, for this virus. Um, and it's really not. Um, we don't actually have good correlates of protection yet. Um, so clearly T cells are playing a role. One thing that frightens me about the entire variant conversation, especially with regard to immune protection, is the, the constant focus on mutations in the receptor binding domain of spike. That is not the only thing that determines uh, if the immune system is going to effectively target a viral infection. Um, that's also not the only part of a virus that determines uh, how sick you're going to be. Um, there are 25 other proteins encoded by SARS coronavirus 2. There are mutations throughout the genome uh, in many of these variants that are different from one another. We spent so much time focusing on these mutations that abrogate neutralizing antibody binding that we haven't paid attention to any of these other mutations and any of these other genes that can also have an impact on pathogenicity and virulence. So I think, as well as immune protection for, from things like T cell epitopes, for example. So I think that, you know, there's, we need to have a little more humility in our public discussions about this significant Certainly, I completely agree with, with Akiko and with Christian that, that you know, we are seeing evidence of convergent evolution. We are seeing that, that some of these variants, very clearly the mutations, are providing some kind of fitness advantage uh, or immune evasion advantage, but there's still a lot more that we need to know about these other mutations that seem to be arising. Yeah, to your point, uh, the receptor binding domain has been kind of centric thinking, and just today, there's been a couple of reports about the importance of the N-terminus domain and antibodies uh, to that. Um, well, there's a question here um, from uh, Gerald Powell uh, at Salk, and he says to Peter, uh, is anyone using BERT to define healthy people and find multigenic disease susceptibility? Is this respect with the advantage of having two terabytes uh, memory on the TPU as opposed to the 32 gigabytes of the V100 or 512 <laughs> gigabytes with the N uh, V link. So I'll turn that to you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first off, I, I, I guess the second part of the question is really uh, touching on um, the different um, uh, computer silicon architecture choices, and and those are important. But I, I don't think they make a meaningful difference, uh, broadly speaking, at least at the scales. Uh, so uh, the number of companies or entities outside of China that are experimenting with these hyperscale models is exactly two. It, it's um, Microsoft and Google, um, and you know these have we you know, these involve in both companies multi-billion-dollar uh, 
silicon and data center investments in order to build the size of the computing machines in order to experiment with these things. And in both cases, uh, when you're investing that much, uh, you have to have some potential return on investment that you're looking at. Uh, not that it isn't speculative, but, um, but you know, there has to be some story there. And, um, and so that means that the actual amount of progress that we've made and what we are seeing isn't fully disclosed. Uh, having said that, there is a desire to open these things up more broadly. And, um, and even, for example, in the work with adaptive, you know, the immune code data set, we're trying to publish every, all of the raw data open uh, in order to uh, facilitate research. But, um, you know, especially with the language models, what we're finding is that we can't quite control what they say. Um, and they can say things that would be harmful or embarrassing. And so that right now is something that until we have a way to control that, you know, would have to be um, handled very, very carefully. On the first part of the question, um, the, uh, so, so we think that the potential to, for example, to use extremely large bird style models to drastically accelerate the molecular dynamics stage um, of say drug discovery um, is very significant. And we're talking maybe, you know, up to five or six orders of magnitude uh, acceleration. Um, and so that's something that not just these two companies outside of China, but several companies within China, I think are pursuing pretty aggressively. And, um, you know, I, I don't know that anyone can say that they will know where that will end up. But, uh, but you know, it, in a way, those problems are going along with all the other kind of commercial potential of, of these neural models. Great. Thanks, Peter. This is to uh, Angie from Michael Steam. Uh, and others on the panel. Moving away from the spike protein, what do you think about mutations of ORF8 and a possible connection to increased replication leading to higher viral load in the new variants? So I think the, the ORF8 thing comes from a couple different things. So there's a, a stop codon mutation uh, in the B117 that uh, induces a premature stop codon in ORF8. And that results essentially in probably a non-functional ORF8 protein be, being expressed. Previously, during the SARS classic uh, epidemic, um, mutations in ORF8 uh, were associated with lower virulence. Um, and, and that was a, a theory of how that, that was able to spread more effectively because it wasn't making people as sick. Now, that's just a theory about how B117 might be spreading. Um, I don't think that that alone is the secret to increased transmissibility. Um, it's not really consistent either with the reports that B117 is more virulent. Um, although, you know, I'm not entirely sure uh, what I think about that, considering that that's just an increased risk of hospitalization it's, and death. Uh, it's not necessarily a mechanism by which uh, the B117 variant is actually more pathogenic. Um, so, I mean, the jury's out. I think that certainly there could be an effect uh, one way or the other from a premature stop codon in ORF8, but we, we just haven't really done those studies. That would, that would need to be done in animal models, uh, and that, that type of mechanistic work takes time. All right. Christian, do you think the B117 uh, has increased lethality, which has been noted, but not certain? Uh, I do. I, I, I would say the jury is still out. I totally agree on that. But, but I, you know, given everything we see with potential longer infectious periods, potentially higher viral loads, we're clearly seeing increased transmissibility. I think the most parsimonious explanation for the observations that it leads to higher rates of, of hospitalization and death, which we have seen not just in the UK, but in the Denmark and other places too, I, I do think is a real, a real effect. What does that come down to exactly in terms of the mechanism of the virus? I don't know. I think probably some of the spike mutations play a role, but I'm pretty convinced that other genes play a role here too. Like we talked about interferon previously, for example, in SP6 and other mutations we find there. 
I do think could could play an important role in 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 determining that as well. I don't think it's just a spike if it's the spike at all. Right, right. Well, I have to say, I, I could go on with this panel. This is very sad for me to end this panel because uh, this is the dream team that we assembled. Uh, you know, my favorite <laughs> immunologist, virologist, AI scientist, and Christian all in one time. You just can't beat this. So thanks so much for all of you for joining today at the Spectrum. Uh, it's really been uh, intellectually stimulating and uh, I'm sure we'll come up with f further synapses to explore ideas together. And thanks to the, all the participants for, for joining and for asking good questions. And just in closing, and this is the end of uh, two days of a lot of life science, a lot of drug discovery, a lot of you know, cutting edge stuff, especially here on the pandemic in this last panel. We wanted to thank uh, our sponsors, uh, Diamond Sponsor with Illumina, which was incredibly, incredibly generous. They have been for years in our future of individualized medicine. Platinum Sponsors, Alexandria, Real Estate, Equities, Abvi. Uh, Ambrix and Dexcom, and our gold sponsor, Biomarin Pharmaceutical. So please be sure to check out the booths in the expo hall. The live booths will be open until 5 p.m. Pacific time, and they'll be on demand if you missed any of the presentations. And there's also an R&D collection, which will go on uh, for this afternoon. So thanks so much for joining us and being part of the Spectrum Summit.